Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. We're going to be in John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We give them away for free on the sides, but we'll also have the Scripture up here on the screen. I want to welcome you all here. I also want to welcome anybody who is joining us live stream. Thanks for joining us over the internet. Uh, it's pretty cold. I would be tempted to stay home today. Uh, I don't usually get cold, but man, I got up and I went up this morning and I was like, man, it is so cold outside. I cannot wait for Jesus to come back to reverse the curse of coldness. And, <laughs> and I said, what am I doing here in Michigan? And then I was like, I'm here because of the lakes. That's why. So, so feel good about yourself. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so before we do anything, join me in a word of prayer. Join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word, which is true. Your word that corrects all of the lies that we believe, that shows all of our motivation, that searches our hearts and our minds, that guides us into the truth. We thank you for your word that points us to your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that Jesus would be magnified. We pray that you'd help us to encounter him and to know him. We pray that you would help me, Lord, to handle your word well. You would give people eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand your beauty. Lord, we thank you. We commit this morning over to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today we start a new series, which I'm super excited about, Encountering Jesus. We're talking about Encountering Jesus. We're going to walk through the Gospel of John and look at almost every encounter Jesus had with a person. Almost every encounter he had with a person. So today, our first sermon is, Will the real Jesus please stand up? Will the real Jesus please stand up? Today, we live in a day and age where we confuse who Jesus is, who he was, what he's come to do, what he's about. And we're going to get back to the core because the story here, this, this gospel message, this book in John starts with some radical statements about Jesus. It starts, with, it starts with him, who he is and what he's come to do before it gets into the story of him walking this earth. And so the question I have for us this morning, I want you to think about this. This is the most important question in your entire lifetime. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Think about that. That's the most important question you will answer in your lifetime. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you ever encountered his presence? Have you ever experienced his grace? Have you ever been in his presence, in his power? Do you know him? And I'm not saying just do you know about him. Because anybody who's ever met Jesus has never walked away unchanged. Some fall at his feet and worship him. Others want to throw him off of a cliff, a literal cliff. You just read the gospel stories. Some fall on their knees and yell, get away from me. And others worship him as God. This Jesus, this man who, who lived among us and walked among us, this God man. Who is he? Who is he? We cannot meet the real Jesus without radical change. It is impossible. He's one who can, some try to manage and control him, but he can't be managed. He can't be controlled. He's the son of God. He's the source of all life. He is the Savior and the Lord. So you, do you know him this morning? We can't escape him. His birth was so monumental, it divided history in two parts. His name is so powerful, it changes people's lives. His name is also used as a cuss word, which is so strange to me. Imagine if someone had made a mistake and yelled out, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> or they're angry at people and they yell out, Bill Clinton, what's wrong with you people? Wouldn't that be weird? But yet, they use Jesus' name as a curse word at times. We can't escape him. We can't escape him. And when I remember as a kid seeing pictures of Jesus, and we have some here today. Tell me, you know, when you see this, what do, you, do, you, do you think Jesus actually looked like this? Glowing face. Uh, you know, he had this long flowing hair, this hard hair. So let's give a couple more. These are the modern ideas of we think of Jesus. This, this beautiful, pretty boy, you know, like, oh, look at how glowing he is. Uh, you know, you have this, the blonde hair, blue eyes, thin, uh, you know, kind of boring looking, stoic. And then today we have the, the hipster Jesus. You know, Jesus is my homeboy. All right. So we have these pictures of him, probably the most famous one. 
He's just sitting there. And this is the one I remember as a child. You'd see his, his eyes were just so peaceful. His hair was long and flowing. It was like Fabio. He just looked so comfortable. <laughs> he looked so safe. And I borrow this from Philip Yancey. He looked kind of like a Mr. Rogers, right? No sharp edges to him. He's comfortable. He's assuring. He's, he's someone you can, you can be part of your life a little bit. It's, 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 it's nice. It's, it's comfortable to be around him. And again, he's safe. But is this, is this the real Jesus? Is this what Jesus looked like? Did he look like any of those pictures? No, not even close. He wasn't white. He didn't have long hair. It wasn't blonde, I pr- assume. He looked probably like a modern-day Iraqi. The Bible says that there was nothing in him that would attract us to him. And he didn't act like that either. He didn't act like some boring stoic who just sat around and prayed all day. That's not the real Jesus. And when we come to Christ, we come to who he is, we see in him the answers to some of the deepest, most impactful questions that we all ask. What am I here for? What's the purpose of my life? What am I doing? What am I supposed to be about? What's wrong with the world? How can I help fix that? What's wrong with me? Why do I do the things that I do and act the way that I act and think the way that I think? What's the purpose of my life? We find in Jesus an answer to all of these questions and so, so, so much more. For example, Tim Keller says this, do you think it's generally a good idea to be kind to your enemies and reach out to them rather than kill them. Is that a good idea? Well, this idea that you should love your enemies came exclusively from Christianity and nowhere else. It came exclusively from Jesus. He's impacted the way that you think, the way you go out of business, you go about your business, and you don't even know. He's impacted cultures and the world in ways that we can't even grasp. He, he, he's, he is the most important person to ever walk on this planet Earth And Jesus, when we see him, he didn't care what others thought about him, but yet he cared deeply about others. He scorned fame, but yet he became the most famous person in the entire world. We we see in him the the, the religious establishment looked at him as a threat and a troubler of peace, and he railed against this establishment for their hypocrisy, for their self-righteousness, for their bitterness, for the ways they've hardened their, their hearts to the truth of God. We see in Jesus a person who loved Others who sinners love to hang out with, but yet did not tolerate sin for a moment. How do you balance that? How, do we, how does that come together? We find in Jesus, one who sees all of our faults and failures, who sees the deepest, darkest parts of our hearts and all of our actions that we've ever done, but yet still loves us. Still loves us. And we see in him a Savior who, though he never sinned, died for our sins. And he rose from the dead. So wherever you are this morning, do you know him? Do you know this Christ? Maybe you feel like you're dead in your faith. Maybe you feel like you just made yourself, forced yourself to come into church. Put on a fake face that you don't have any faith right now, that you're dead in your faith. Well, guess what? Jesus has a propensity to raise the dead. And he can do that with you this morning. And he can do that with you as we walk through his word here. All right, and so the big idea... The big idea of this sermon, and really the big idea of our entire series, is that Jesus, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ? And we're going to be examining that. We're going to be looking at this. We're going to be seeing about who Jesus is. And so before we open up the Gospel of John, I love this book. I want to just give you a brief idea of it. It's written to show us this intimate picture this way of how he dealt with people on an, an individual basis, how he dealt on their level when he came to them. It shows this intimacy, this friendship. It gives us a better grasp of who he is. Just a beautiful book. And it tells us its purpose. The purpose of the Gospel of John is found in John 20. Here's what it says. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why this book is written, that we may see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that we may have life in his name. So our goal is this, that our faith would be renewed. Our goal is that we would encounter this resurrected Christ. Our goal is that our life would be transformed and changed, that we would love Jesus more than we've ever loved him in our lives. 
As we see who he is, we see what he's done, we see what he's come to do for us. I don't know, are you excited or what? Yeah. All right, well, wake up. <laughs> so do you know him? Do you know him? And we're going to see three things. Know the true word. See the real Jesus and experience grace and truth. Know, see, and experience. We know, see, and experience. So we're in John 1, 1. Here's what it says. This is God's word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So the beginning of this, this, this book here, does it sound familiar to anybody? In the beginning, where else do we see that? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is almost a prequel to Genesis. This is be before this. In the beginning, it says there was the word. And what does this mean, this, this, the word? And the word was with God and the word was God. That's, that's weird for us to get our minds around this and to grasp this reality. And so what we need to know is that the scriptures were written originally. They weren't written in English. They were written originally in the Greek language. Greek language. And this idea, this idea of the word here is the Greek word logos. Logos. I know it looks like logos, but it's pronounced logos. Logos. It's, it's, the, it's the idea of the, the meaning behind everything else. It's the rational principle. It's the question. It's the answer to every question that we have. It's the purpose of why things are the way that they are. It, it's, it defines our existence. It's the logos, the logos. It's the Greek idea. It's, it's the message. It's the point. It's the meaning of life. All knowledge and existence is found in this, almost kind of like the force in Star Wars, but yet even deeper than that. And the Greek idea, the Greek philosophy at the time, had this idea that this logos was almost impossible to obtain. They couldn't, they tried to answer these questions. Why do we be nice to people? Why do I love other people? Why do I care what other people think? What am I doing? And why am I going about my business? Why am I working? Why, why do I want to live anywhere? Why do I get up the next morning? And they had no way to answer this question. They had no way to define this, this logos of their lives. But here, this radical statement's made, the beginning here, the beginning of John's gospel, that Jesus is the answer, that he is the source of all things, that everything you're looking for is found in him. He is the answer to every question. He was there with God in the beginning, and guess what? He is God. We see this, this idea of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit right here. That Jesus is this. He is all of these things. He's what you are looking for. He's what you were made for. And when we understand this, we understand that he's the logos, that he, everything in our life starts to make sense when we grasp and see and we encounter him. So let me give you an example of sometimes that we don't always use things the way they're supposed to be used. When I had my first job, I opened up a bank account. And when you open a bank account, they send you all this stuff, and they sent me a debit card. A debit card. All right, when I got it, I was like, what is this thing? I've heard of a credit card, but I've never heard of a debit card. Again, I was a teenager, so bear with me. I didn't know what it was, and so I tried using it. I went to an ATM, and when you use your debit card in an ATM, what happens? They charge you money, unless you go to your bank. They charge you money to use that ATM, and then your bank charges you an interest charge. So I used it a couple times, and I was like, this thing is stupid. I just got to waste money using it. This doesn't make any sense. I hate this thing. And so someone said, hey, you know that debit card, you could use it almost like a credit card. And I said, really? Like, yeah, you can buy stuff online, and you can go and pay for stuff with it. And I was like, no way. You're crazy, man. So I realized I can start doing that. So I started buying stuff online. I started buying people lunches. I'm like, hey, on me, let's just swipe it. And then it said insufficient funds. And I was like, oh, that money comes from my account. Remember, I was a teenager. I had to learn these things. But when I understood the logos of it, the purpose behind it, I could, I could really grasp the power of it. And that's the same with Jesus. It's the same with Jesus. He is the purpose behind everything. He is the, the source behind it all. He is the, 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 again, I said it, the answer to every question that we have. He is the meaning of our lives. In him was life. Without him, there is nothing. 
He is the one where we find this. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not embarrassed of that. I'm not going to present to you a neuter Christ that's palatable to our hearts and our minds. We're going to look at the Scriptures and see and let it stand for itself. And this is what he says about himself. There was never a time where Jesus was not. He always was. Let that sink into your heart and mind for just a minute. There was never a time where Jesus was not. Think back like a billion years ago. Guess who was there? Jesus, like two billion years ago. Think back like when everything started. Guess who was there before everything started? Jesus. Does this sound like some neutered Lord? No. He's the Lord of all. All things were made through him. Everything finds its existence in him. He knows how all things work. He knows how all things work. I'll give you another example of this. When I first met my wife, she's from Minnesota, and I'm a city boy from the south suburbs of Chicago. She loved snowboarding. And I, the biggest thing I ever did was go down a sled on a little tiny hill. It's a lot different when you go into like a black diamond snowboarding hill. So we went, you know, our first time I visited her, well, she took me snowboarding, and I didn't want to look like a chicken, and I didn't want to look like a fool, but I had no idea what I was doing. You ever try getting on one of those lifts, and you don't know what you're doing? It's really, really hard. And so getting off of it was like impossible. So I would just fall in the snow, get up, and, and, and we'd go on this hill. And she's like, okay, I'll go first. And she would go down so graciously, and the powder would just fall up, and she would just slowly and gracefully go down. And I was like, all right, man, pull up your pants, man up, you're going down this hill. And I didn't know what I was doing. So all I would do was go straight down like a bowling ball, because I didn't know how to car- carve or move to the left or to the right in any means. And I did everything I could not to hit somebody. And then I'd get to the bottom of the hill, and the only thing I knew what to do was fall back and just crash. And it was fun for the first couple times, but after about three or four or five, it kind of hurts, and it got really old. And someone pulled me aside, someone who knew what they were doing, who snowballed or snowboarded their whole life. And they said, hey, I know how this works. Let me show you how this works. And they taught me. Within five minutes, it was so easy. When I found out the key, when I found out the understanding of it, that person taught me how to do it. And so I could join in and do the same things. And that's like Jesus. He is the one who understands all things. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what you brought in this morning. He knows the depression that you face. He knows the anxiety that you face. He knows the insecurities that you harbor in your heart. He knows the marital relationships that you're dealing with. He knows your issues. He knows what's going on with you. And he still loves you. And he's still with you. And he says, I have the answer for these things. He is the Logos, the Logos of all things. And and, and on a side note, I would say this, Jehovah's Witness, has anybody ever been visited by a Jehovah's Witness? They don't believe this. They actually translate this scripture differently. That's not right. They would say, in the beginning was the, the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They add that in there. That's not what it says. But it doesn't make any sense, because even in their own scriptures that they manipulate, is the next verse. It says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. They would say that Jesus was created, but yet nothing was made that was made without him. He is the creator of it all. He is God himself. He was there. He has not changed, and he will not change. So do you, do you know this Christ? And in him his life is found, and the light of men. If you think about every other religion in the world, every other philosophy, we got to come back and circle and think about these things. It's always what you have to do to get to God, how you have to make yourself better, how you have to make yourself right, how you have to act, how you have to change, how you have to obtain to these things. But Jesus and Christianity is so different. It's what God did to get to us. Instead of building a ladder to get to God, he is the ladder to God. He brings us there. He is the source. He is the life. He is everything. And and, and it says that he is the light. And sometimes we get uncomfortable with this idea because the light is risky. What does the light do? What does the light do? It exposes darkness. It takes darkness away. And, and, and we don't like that all the times. Uh, uh, people say, especially in our culture, God doesn't exist and I hate him. God doesn't exist and I hate his guts. Doesn't make any sense. Why is that? Why is it? Because we want to be our own gods. We want to be our own gods. We at times are like vampires. When the light gets on us, we just 
shrink up and try to curl and go away. We don't want to be exposed. We allow Jesus part of our life. We allow him to come into some things in our life. But we don't want to bring him into the skeletons in our closet. We don't want to give him full access. We don't want the claims that he makes over us. We don't want to give all of those things to him. We like Jesus over there. We don't like Jesus all around us and through us and in our business. We don't like that. But here's what I want to say to you. You can't stop the light. You can't stop it. It's going to come. It's going to expose the darkness. And we are a place of freedom. There is no shame here. This isn't a super resort for the saints who haven't figured out. This is a place where we experience grace and redemption. This is a place where we meet Jesus, where we encounter him. And we're not not, not, not embarrassed of you, whatever you brought into this room. Not ashamed of you, and neither is Jesus. And I was just talking to somebody from my hometown this week. And they were telling me about all of the issues going on in their family. The husband was, was, has a secret sex addiction that he's just spending all of his time in. He got caught committing an affair, but yet he lied and lied and lied. He still tried to cover it up. And how their family's just falling apart. This person said to me, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get you during this week. I'm just dumping all this stuff on you. And they flippantly kind of said, hey, you know, you're a pastor. You probably hear this all the time. And I jokingly responded, yeah, I hear it once a week. And then, I, and then when I thought about it, you know, it's really true. Hear about this stuff once a week of life's falling apart, of the darkness that that just consumes people. Well, there's grace for you. Jesus is the light. He's come to expose it, not to shame you, but to clean you, to free you, to transform you. So come to the light. Know the word. Know the word. Do you know the word? Do you know him? Do you know him? So let's look at verse 9, the real Jesus to see the real Jesus. Here's what it says. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So Jesus has come. He's come. But here's the thing. Most people have a misconception of who he is. They, have the, they came to his own. Even his own people, the Jews, did not really grasp. Most of them, or some of them, did not really grasp who he truly was, who he truly is. And that exists today with us. We have these views of Jesus. And I would say this. We have all these misconceptions of him. The first misconception we have of Jesus is that he was just a good moral teacher. Has anybody heard that before? Jesus is just a good moral teacher. That he run around and taught some really nice things, some good laws, some good principles. Follow the golden rule. Love your neighbor. Obey your parents. These are all great things. But here's the catch. Good moral teachers don't tend to be crucified and falsely accused as criminals, do they? Good moral teachers don't tell you to love them with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength to put nothing in front of them. Good moral teachers don't make the claim that they are God and they created everything. Do they do that? They don't. They don't do that. And I have a a lengthy quote from C.S. Lewis that I want to read to you. C.S. Lewis says this, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. It's about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I can't accept his claim as God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who merely was a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to. Jesus is not just a great moral teacher. He's more than that. That is a modern misconception. And then we have this idea of boring Jesus, that Jesus is boring. Jesus is boring. I know I had that idea for so long, that Jesus was boring. That if we think Jesus is boring, we don't know the real Jesus. He doesn't just sit around all day and pray. He was the one who created all things. He talks about joy more than anybody else in the Bible. He's the one who knows life. 
He's the one who experience, he would give us this experience and this grace. He knows these things. He is not boring, not in any means. But then we have safe Jesus. We want one who's comfortable and convenient, one who fits into our lives, one that we can just kind of have when we want, when it's convenient for us. But this is not him at all. He takes us on unexpected adventures. He pushes us forward even when we don't want to go. He gets us out of our comfort zones. He meets us where we are. Yes and amen to that. But he doesn't leave us where we are. He pushes us forward. He is not safe. He's not boring. And he's not just a good moral teacher. But then we have this crazy one, the legend Jesus, that Jesus never existed, that he was just a legend. Anybody hear that? I, I'm trying to, to be kind, more kind in my words. I'll just say that it's silly and absurd. I want to use some other words, but I like my job very much, and I don't want to use them. The amount of historical and verifiable evidence of the life of Christ is just insane. The amount of evidence to if historical historical evidence to his resurrection. Historical evidence of his life. Not only do we have all the scriptures, but everything outside of that. It's, it's, it's people have this idea because Jesus is so patronizing, such a figure, that a polarizing figure, that he, that he makes all the claims. They can't get him out of their mind. They have to deny that he even existed. And then we get the rich Jesus, this, this rich Jesus, that I can use Jesus to get what I want, that, that hey, I can follow him as, as Lord as long as my health and my wealth are good. I can use Jesus. And then we have the social justice Jesus, the final one, that Jesus, he said so much about the poor and, and about how we should treat each other. This is what Jesus is really about. But yet Jesus did not come to make us nice, good social people. He came to make us new and redeem us. So how can we describe Jesus Christ to you? I don't have the words to do it, but I want to show a video from a guy named S.M. Lockridge called That's My King. So we could play this video describing who Jesus is. The Bible says my king is a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. 
He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. That's my king. That's the best description I've ever heard of Jesus. So it was, it was good. And the good news is when we get this and we know this king, we know this king, we become part of God's family. Through all who do receive him, they become children of God. That's the good news, good news of seeing the real Jesus. So do you know him? And the last thing I want us to see here is ex experience his grace and truth. Experience his grace and truth. Look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. He has made him known. So we get this, this idea, this, this truth, this, this logos becomes flesh. The word becomes flesh and dwelt among us. That Jesus Christ is fully God, 100%. Fully man. Not 50-50. He's, he's the God man. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. He walked where we walked. He experienced what we experienced. And even more so than that. And, and he, he came in order to redeem man. Gee, God had to become man. And we find in Jesus the perfection of truth and grace coming together. Coming together. Not partial truth, not partial grace, but full grace, full of truth and grace. And this is a balance that is really hard to strike. This is a balance really hard to strike. We need to experience his grace and his truth. Truth without grace produces self-righteousness. Grace without truth produces moral compromise. So this is where we tend to fall in this line, and we tend to see God in one category or the other. We tend to see God as only truth, or mostly truth, and all about laws and rules and regulations, or we tend to see God only of grace, that he's all about letting us do what we want. He doesn't make any claims over us, doesn't tell us what to do. He just loves us and accepts us. We tend to see God through these lenses. We tend to see Jesus through these lenses. And we tend to act and have an attitude towards others through these lenses. This idea of grace or truth. We, we fall in one category or the other. Let me give you a couple examples of that. Uh, when I drive, I like to drive quickly. I don't always pay attention to the speed limit. I'm trying to get better in that. But I would take trips all of the time. And, and I've been pulled over many times. And, and there's times when I've been pulled over. And, 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 and a cop will come to me, he'll take my license and registration, go to the car, come back, give me a ticket. He said, you are speeding? Here's what you get. And there's nothing I can say. That's the truth. He was right. I broke the law. That's my, that's my consequence for breaking the law in that moment. And then there'll be other times where a cop will come up, he'll get my license and registration, run and come back and says, hey, what was going on? Why were you speeding? Where, where are you going? What do you do? Well, I said, well, hey, I'm a pastor and I'm just going back to my church. <laughs> And he's like, oh, okay, can you pray for me? I said, yes, could you get me out of this ticket? And he'll let me off sometimes. That's grace. That's grace. He's, he's given me grace in that area. Uh, Philip Yancey says it best. Truth is a set of beliefs. Grace is an attitude toward others. Truth is a set of beliefs. It doesn't change. But grace is an attitude toward others. People who see the lens of grace, tra truth and grace see things differently. People who are more gracious, they tend to see things as nuanced. They don't see black and white issues. They're usually a little bit more pleasant to be around and way more tolerant, but they usually confuse the difference between what is right and wrong. They usually do confuse the difference between what is right and wrong, and they lack at times the courage to speak out because they don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. They don't want to get in the way. They don't want to cause any issues. Uh, they, they allow for mistakes, and they're quick to forgive. And grace is a great thing. Grace is an awesome thing. But sometimes 
sometimes when you just have this category of grace without truth, it goes awry. Uh, I know uh, parents who really love their kids, who give their kids everything they want, though, and their kids never grow up. And I know uh, guys who still live at home in their 20s and 30s, and their parents give them everything they need. They pay all their bills. They give them money. They give them a car. They give them a place. They only give them grace all the time. They never give them the truth. It's like, hey, you need to man up. You need to go get a job. You need to go find a wife. You need to get out of here. But they don't do it. It's just grace. And equally, and sometimes even more damaging, is truth people. And, and, and truth is a good thing. It's a respectable thing. People are dignified. People who see black and white. They have convictions and principles. They know the difference between right and wrong, and they're not afraid to stand out. And those are praise God for those things. Praise God for people like that. But people who are, who are only truth, they don't allow for mistakes. They are slow to forgive. They're slow to show mercy. They're hard on others. Uh, I know a man whose father, his, a, f- a father who had a son. I know this guy personally. When his son was a late teenager, he, he, he fell away from the faith. He rebelled. He wanted to go his own way. And so he's like, hey, you know what? I'm going to stop following Jesus. And his dad was just so offended by that. He said, all right, you know what? If that's the case, our relationship is cut off. You, you are cut off. And, and so this went on for six months to a year. And then his son reached out to the father. And he played in a band. And he said, hey, we're playing at this concert uh, it's a small concert. I would like you to come. The son reached out to him. And the father asked me, what should I do? What should I do? I said, I think you should go. He said, no way I'm going to, no way. I can't even let that in my mind. If I go, it means I compromise what he's done. Not of any way, shape, or form am I going. He had no category for grace. He had no category for mercy. He had no understanding of the gospel. Just the truth. And so what we see in Jesus is the perfection of truth and grace coming together. Truth and grace coming together. It's kind of like broccoli and cheese. You know, hear me out. If anybody in this room says they like broccoli, I'll call you a liar. When I was a kid, it's the, it was literally the most disgusting thing in the world. If you, unless you cook it with a bunch of oil and salt, it's not even palatable. And when I was a kid, my mom wanted to give me broccoli because she, she wanted to give me nutrition. Broccoli's kind of like truth. It's good for you, but it's not very good to taste. It's not very good to taste. But then my mom would take cheese, and she would melt it on the broccoli. And cheese, I love cheese. It's so good. It's rich. When you melt it, it's so tasty, and, and it just covers it, and it's delicate. But cheese by itself lacks nu- the nutrition. But when you mend those two together, you get the good taste of cheese and the nutrition of broccoli, and it's perfect. It's a great, it's a great thing to eat. And Jesus is, is so much better. He's the perfection of truth and grace coming together as one, that he can look right into your life, he can look right into your life, and he doesn't excuse one thing you do, but he, he comes and loves you right there, that he would be willing to die for that. He'd be willing to die for you. He doesn't compromise truth one time, not once, but he does not fail to show grace one time. He's the perfection of that. We need to know this about Jesus. And when we get this about Jesus, we understand this, the Son of God, this perfection of truth and grace, not only does it transform our lives, but allows us to show people truth and grace as well. This is what the world is longing for. This is what people need more than anything else. The truth of God, experienced by the grace of God. I know when I was a young person, like many of you sitting over here, it's what I long for so deeply. I grew up in a church that was only about truth, only about truth and all of these things, and it didn't have any category for grace. We need both together. And when we have that, there's nothing that will stop us. Think about the early church. They didn't have a building. They didn't have a strategy. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have a book of how to reach people. They didn't have seminars of how to grow big churches. They didn't have laser lights or smoke shows. They didn't have many instruments to play music, even though they had some. But yet nothing could stop them. They grew exponentially because they embodied truth and grace. They understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. They proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we all need more than anything else. Do you know him? Do you know him? Have you encountered him? Well, you're going to encounter him here, whether you like it or not. 
And I am looking forward to it. I'm praying for that. And I'm excited that we're here. And I'm excited about where God's going to move us. So I want to finish this last word, this last verse out, because there's something telling here. At verse 18, let's look at this last thing. No one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side has made him known. And this is a big deal. We cannot know God without Jesus. It's impossible. He is the Son of God. He reveals who the Father is to us. And the, uh, most of our Bibles that we bring here this morning, the one that I'm using, uh, the ESV version, they just kind of miss this translation a little bit. It says that, that no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. The Father's side. Now, you're going to remember this for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean side. It actually is the word bosom. All right, everyone say bosom. It's a good biblical word, all right? I know you're thinking, like, bosom, that's weird. But it's the idea, this, this, the bosom of the Father. is isn't, isn't some sexualized word, but it's the idea of closeness, the idea of intimacy, the idea of, 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 of unity and deep friendship and community and, and, and being of the like mind and heart of in the same thing. The Bible says that Jesus is, is at the Father's bosom, and he's there advocating. He's there showing us the way. He's there compelling us to bring us into this deep relationship, this deep unity, this deep friendship, this deep encounter with God like we've never encountered him before. He wants us there. He wants to bring us there. He wants to move us forward in those ways. And he's patient with us. All of us in this room are at different levels of our faith. Some of us in here don't know Jesus yet. And praise God that you're here. Some of us are new, new followers of Jesus. Some of us have been believers for 20, 30 years. And this, this, this series is something for all of us because this is God's word. I pray for a recommitment of our lives, a renewal of our faith, taking us deeper to understanding the person and the work of Jesus. And he's going to be patient with you wherever you're at, whatever pace you're going. He's going to walk with you through that. And he's going to come. He's going to be with us through this. I believe that. I believe